How we doing this evening? All right. Uh, let's uh, let's let's pray. Um, you guys got your Bibles? Uh, we're gonna be in First Corinthians chapter nine. So I'll let you get there. First Corinthians chapter nine. When you get it, say got it. All right, all right. We just coming. It's coming. All right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening, this opportunity, Lord, to gather. Uh, God, I thank you for every man that is here tonight. And uh, Father, I pray as we open up your word, we believe that it is living, powerful. God, you know every man in this room. And I pray as your word goes forth tonight, Lord, you would meet each guy right where he's at. God, there are guys that need to be encouraged, strengthened, and built up. I pray you would do that through the word tonight. God, there are guys that need to be drawn close to you, uh, convicted, challenged. Lord, I pray you would do all that's needed tonight. Meet with us in this place. Lord, draw us close to yourself. Be glorified in our midst. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So uh, we're going to cover uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. And uh, I want to kind of give you, you know, kind of what's, what's in my heart, you know, as we are preparing. I, I, there's a couple of rules I have. Whenever I get an opportunity to speak to men, um, I just feel like there's some things we should talk about. You know, this is, uh, this is different than Sunday morning. The, your wives are not here. And so there are things that I would probably not do in mixed company. But when it's just us, I feel like it would be a wasted opportunity. So um, I was praying about, you know, like, it's, you know, I know it's a Christmas time. Christmas message and everything else, and I'm not doing a Christmas message. Uh, Y'all will get that Sunday closer to Christmas and everything else. But here was my thought, right? This is something I do in my family every year. As we come upon Christmas, and for me, the month of December is a reflective month for me. Every year when December rolls around, um, it's a month where I'm kind of evaluating myself. There were things that I had set out to do last year. There were things that I had that were goals that were things that needed to be overcome and dealt with last year. And in December, it's like an evaluation. How did I do? Um, have I grown? Am I better in my walk with the Lord? Am I moving forward? Am I a better husband? Am I a better Christian? Am I doing the things God told me to do as a dad? What's my devotional life? It's a chance for me to just, man, evaluate myself. Anybody here get an evaluation at work? Some of you guys, all right, so sometimes, you know, I get an evaluation, and it's like, hey, it's a great year, praise God, you know, God's all bad, but I've had some evaluations, and again, this is just self-evaluation, where, nah, man, this is not, you, you haven't, you haven't, you have not made any progress, matter of fact, you've fallen backwards, and so, um, and here's the mindset, right, because I'm getting ready to start another year, and the years are just rolling by, if you don't pause and pay attention to how you're coming along at some point, There'll be years of roll by, and you'll look back, and it's like, man, you've been in church 20 years. There ain't no evidence, you know, and I don't want to be that guy, right? Um, you know, I, I started back going to the gym, right? Now, you know, for me, you know, if in about a year, I'm giving myself about a year, um, it, it, you know, it should be it really, rather, it, should be, it should be in a, some months, you know what I'm saying? But if you go to the gym every day, five years straight, and we look at you, and we can't tell, what are you doing in the gym? I mean, you're going, but you some, some, something's not connecting. I mean, are you picking up weights when you go there? What do you do at the gym? So, you know, some of us, you know, people know we show up at church. We're there faithfully. Um, but is your wife seeing heaven? Are your kids seeing, wow, he, my dad's growing. He loves Jesus more. He's more gracious. He's more patient. My dad's more like Christ now than he was three years ago. Or do they just know that you're the same old dude, but you go to church? Uh, and my, my heart, guys, is that, you know, I, I know I believe it's God's heart. God, God, God wants to change us. Amen. Uh, but in order for that to happen, we got to be real. Uh, we got I got to be real. I got to be genuine. I got to let God do business in my life. If you get good at being fake. Right. You, you, that, that's that's you're going to be stuck right there. If you get good at pretending to be good, you'll never get any better. You'll just be a better liar, a better faker. And so um, we got to take down the, the veil and the walls and just say, God, deal with me. Open me up. And so Paul the Apostle is one of my heroes of the faith. A um, couple things I like about the Apostle Paul. One, uh, Paul, when he was not a believer, was a very passionate man. Amen. He was zealous about what he was doing. 
Uh, Paul wasn't no just regular non-believer. Uh, Paul was like, look, I believe that, you know, I, he, was, he was a non-believer to the nth. He was killing Christians. He was taking people to jail. And so when he got saved, I feel like it's only fair that if you was going hard in the world, when you come to the Lord, you don't go, you don't get, you don't get passive now. You don't, you don't come to God and then now you're going to get, you know, conservative about how you're living. Now, if you was going hard out there, you should be for the Lord. Man, you should be a real asset to the, to the team, right? Um, LeBron James joined us recently, you know, um, and I had an expectation. Like right? you, I mean, you balled out last year, you know. I, I had an expectation that he better not come to L.A. and then just be soft. No, nah, man, I, I expect some points. I, you know, I expect him to flop and fall and some of that too, you know. But I have, I had some expectations from him. So Paul in First Corinthians here is ministering to a very difficult church, a carnal church that God loved, and. He, he just finished taking them through a section. We're going to cover 24 to 27, and I titled the message Run, Fight, Win, and that's really what we want to do, and we'll see as we get to it. Paul just finished telling them, man, we, we want to do whatever we can to win people to the Lord, right? He saw the importance now that he had been forgiven by God, that he would be carrying that message to other people. Something I think about at Christmas time, right? Christmas time, there are presents under trees, and we're giving gifts away. Well, we've received the greatest gift ever. If you are here tonight and you're a Christian, you have received the greatest gift you will ever receive in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's, but, but this is the trip to me because we're celebrating his birth. If we're celebrating his birth. Don't normally on somebody's birthday, they get something, right? So if I'm celebrating his birth, then I got to ask God, what do you want from me? What, you know, what do you give to the person that has everything? And, and here it is, right? Paul understood this. Paul had received forgiveness from Jesus. Paul had received grace from God. And Paul said, you know what? I know what, I know what God wants. He wants me to tell, he wants other people just like me to come to him. And so Paul just finished sharing. He said, look, I become all things to all men that I might win some. And now he's going to begin to speak about how that, that life, you, you, need to be, you need to be passionate about this life. You could waste it. You could miss it. And so look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. He said, now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. And then verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And so Paul is going to use several sports analogies. And uh, I thought that would be appropriate being that we're at the men's fellowship. I already had somebody get at me about my Dodgers jacket. And, uh, you know, I, I won't start no wars here tonight. I know we got some different groups of folks. I, I, see, a, I see a fallen angels shirt in the back. And, uh, you know, I've seen some other paraphernalia, but we, we won't go there. Paul spoke about, you know, different athletics and things that were going on. And he would use them as analogies in his teachings. And so we know that Paul at least watched the games. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. But Paul said, look, we all run. We're all running a race, but only one person receives a prize. When a race is run, only one person wins. Now, let me just say this about the race, Paul. He's talking about the race of the Christian life. You haven't even registered for the race if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ yet. You're not in the race. You're not running a race. You're not, you're not even part of the program. You haven't registered yet. So I just want to back up one step. At the very end of this message, I will, I will give a plea and I will give an opportunity. If there's men that are sitting in chairs tonight in a church that don't yet know Jesus, why? Because I believe that most of us know who he is and we've heard what he's done. So why haven't you yielded to him yet? Why not? What do you gain? What do you gain by rejecting the Lord? You gain nothing. And if you get good at rejecting God, you might reject them all the way until it's too late to turn. And so don't, don't play that game. You, know, you lose. Every time you, if you, you fight God off, you, you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you, you beat that back. Every time you win that battle, you lose. And you lose a little bit more and a little bit more. And eventually, you can have a heart that's so callous, you're going to stay right there. You're just going to get left lost. And so um, I pray that nobody here, that's your situation. And if you're here tonight and God's been dealing with you, but you haven't come, man, come tonight. Give your life to Jesus tonight. He died to forgive you and to save you and to give you a life worth living, to give you life everlasting. If you haven't received that, um, you need it. You don't need anything else in this life more than you need that. Amen. 
So I'll come back to that, but I just needed to say that before we keep going. So, again, Paul says, look, we all, we're running in a race. So we're believers. We're running in a race. He said, but look, everybody runs in a race, but only one person receives a prize. Run in such a way that you may win. And this is the idea. If I'm running in a race and I want to win the prize, I need to go hard. I need to go. I can't be lackadaisical. I can't be. I got to run in such a way. I got to run like I want to win. Now, in my family, Everybody in my family is very competitive. And so um, we have, you know, if we break out a board game in my house, it's, it's the kids be like, oh, well, if you break out Monopoly in my house, they be like, oh, man, here it goes. You know, we, we don't even do it in front of guests because people be like, y'all ain't saved. You know, it's bad. You know, like there's, there's no mercy for children. You know, the kids be like, dad, I'm out of money. You, this, you should have made better decisions, son. You're out. You know, there ain't no mercy for nobody. We, we play to win. Same thing with my kids in sports, you know. Um, I, you know, if you're going to play a sport, I mean, you got to play to win. Don't cheat. But other than cheat, you play to win. So I put my, my son is in martial arts, um, you know, and I, I, I go to all his tournaments unless they're on a Sunday. I go to tournament with him. I size up the kids he's about to fight, and I school my son. Um, I've even – had, he had one tournament where I'm looking at the kid that he's got to fight, and I'm like – I don't know how this kid is in his same age bracket. Uh, y'all know some kids just be big for nothing. He, this kid was probably, he was probably the right age, but looking at his dad, you know, this kid got some genetic unfair. He was just huge for the age division. And um, I told my son, look, he's won two fights in a row because kids were scared to engage. And so they're stuttering, stuttering, and he just lighting them up. So I said, my son was waiting. He wanted to get some video game. I said, here's our deal, man. I said, I'm, I'm, this is our deal. I said, you got to fight him like you're supposed to win. You got to go at him like you don't worry about how big he is, but you, you're faster. You got to go in and tag him. If you just go hard, I, I don't care win or lose, I'll give you the game. I just need you got to go first every time. My son beat him seven to one. Seven to one, yeah. And point is this, right? If he had a not gone hard, he would have got beat like all the other kids. Um, because this kid had length, he had reach. He had everything else, but it, the mental advantage was bigger than the physical advantage that he had on everybody. And so Paul says, look, we all running, but are we running to win? Are we running to win? Um, are, we, are we giving it all we got? And in terms of your walk with the Lord, the race that God has called you to run, whatever your lane is, everybody here is a little bit different. God called me to be a pastor. Uh, pastor Rob's called to be a pastor. Some of you guys, everybody here is called to be something. But do you do it with, with everything that you have? Are you passionate about your walk with the Lord? Um, is, is, that the, is that the most important thing about your life, your relationship with Jesus, or is there some other thing? Be careful about letting the major thing in your life be something that God don't care about. Because some men have it switched around. Some guys have it when you look at their life and it's like, what's the most important thing in this guy's life? It, it'll be some hobby or some thing that doesn't matter in eternity. And then, and then God is like a condiment to you. God is like the ketchup on a hot dog. Just something that, I got a little Jesus in my life. Jesus is supposed to be everything in our life. Amen? He can't be a condiment. He can't be a hobby. He can't be a side thing. He's everything. And all you got to do is go read the book of Revelation and look at when people, and people in heaven, look at how all the attention in heaven is on the throne. Everything is about him and where he's at because everybody in heaven knows that they're only there because of what he did. And so eventually we all figure this out, that Jesus is everything. But it'd be good if we figured it out this side of eternity so we can live for him the way he's called us to. Again, Paul said, look, we all run, but, 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 but I'm running to win this thing. And so this would have been meaningful to the Corinthians. Uh, their city was the center for some of the, the it was the Isthmian. It was like their Olympic games that they would have, it's similar to our Winter Olympics. And in this, Paul would use different you know, types of sports and competition. Paul in his letters dealt with, he dealt with running, he dealt with boxers, he dealt with gladiators, wrestlers, chariot racers, tro trophies, all these things that go along with sports. And so I can tell that Paul was an avid sports fan or that he was at least interested in it, but I want you to understand that Paul, Paul, Paul still had Jesus first. There was balance. Um, I had a thing with some of the guys in our fellowship where, um, you know, I, I like sports like the next man. But sports kind of have their place in my life. They're not in the forefront. And I get annoyed if I talk to a guy that don't know no Bible verses by heart. He can't tell you where to find this. He can't answer you a Bible question. But you talk to that man for two minutes, he can tell you who's on what team, 
who they scouting, who the coaches are, where they were born, how many kids they got. I'm like, bro, you know, you know everything, you know everything there is to know about what don't matter, and very little about what does matter. And so, men, just be careful. Be careful that that when you should be, maybe, maybe you should be in your downtime when you can be taking in Christian radio that you got on sports radio. Then your downtime when you could be taking in the words, you're taking in the the the, the you know the, the pages, the sports pages. When you're downtime at home and you could be sowing to the spirit, you got ESPN because before you know it, you reap what you sow. And if, if that's all you got to give at the end, if that's all you can, if you can't have a meaningful discussion about the things of God, but if somebody turn it to sports or turn it to whatever it is that you're into, cars, you know, golf, whatever hobby or whatever thing, be careful that you don't that you're not a master in something that don't matter. And, and in a novice in the thing that matters the very most. And every, I'm, I'm speaking to you guys as men because God has made you guys leaders. If you're a man here, you're a leader. If you're a husband, you're a leader to your wife. If you're blessed to be a dad, you're a leader to your kids. And then if you guys are serving with Rob and the men in this church, you guys are the leaders of the church. God has raised up men and established them to lead the way. And so I think that that becomes one of the things that Satan goes after. Let me get these guys into, let me just get them. They're not going to, I want to get them into sin. Let me just get them into dumb stuff. Let me let them let, let me let them give themselves entirely to this silly thing. And so then they're just weak in this thing that, that doesn't matter. Maybe for some of you guys, as you move into a new year, you need to reset your priorities. I'm not running to win. I'm just I'm in the race though, but I'm not running to win. I'm not giving this thing everything I got. I'm not exerting everything I got. If that's you, acknowledge that. There was a point for me, I, I played football coming up. Uh love football. And when God called me to Bible college, God told me to give up football, get watching it, because I watched all the football. I couldn't just, I watched college football on the weekends. I watched regular football when it came. I watched football. Then all the football games that I didn't miss, I watched the shows that told me who won and how that went. And when I went to Bible college, God said, give that up. Just all them hours of basketball and all them hours of football, give me that. And I'm telling you, that was enough for my biblical education. That was enough. Just giving all that up, just setting it aside. And this is what I do in the beginning of the year when, when, when football season kicks in, I don't watch because um, that's because that's how I get hooked. So I don't watch football early in the season. As the, as, the, as the season goes on, if I happen to be home on a Sunday after church and there's games left, I get to watch those. Nothing during the week. That's my that's that's my dis. I'm not saying all y'all all got to do that, but I got some I got some things to take care of and attend to during the week that I know that would get in the way because I got kids. That need to be that they need daddy time, uh, and that, when I was coming up, when I was earlier on, it was between Bible college and kids. God said, "Look, give that up," and I can just tell you, over all the years of not watching it, I don't, I don't miss anything. I, I haven't lost anything. It, it hasn't it hasn't hurt my life. I, I didn't lose any none of my man. I'm, I'm not I'm not any less of a man because I don't know who they scouted or who they got on the team, but I know Jesus. And I've been growing in my relationship with Jesus. And that's really what it's all about. That's what we want to be doing. And so look at now verse 25, Paul says, and to everyone who competes for the prize, I'm sorry, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Yet they do it for, to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. And so Paul says, look, everyone who runs, um, they're temperate, they're self-controlled. And if you look at athletes and look at what they put into what they do, look at what they look, how they work out and um, just the discipline that they put into their crab, their sport. Paul says they do this to win a something that perishes. You know, if you if you watch the UFC, I mean, these guys train all year and they fight all year and they cut weight in the, at the end. I mean, they work and work and work and they do all these things to their bodies to fight and maybe win a belt that they'll maybe get to keep for so many months, so many years, and it's going to be gone and it perishes anyway. He says that's, that they, they work really hard for those things that perish. We're not, we're not working for something that's going to perish. Right? If you put your hand to the plow, if you're, if, you're, if you're a guy that's got your hand to the plow doing a work for the Lord, your hand is to the plow of something that's not going to perish, right? If, if you're leading people to Christ, right, if you're sharing the gospel with people, if you're discipling people, if you're teaching people the word of God, like, this isn't going to perish. This is going to grow. Uh, there'll be fruit that remains for your life. You have something to offer back. You know, you, that, that story of the, of the talents when the, the master came back and the one guy said, look, you, you gave me five and now I got ten. I doubled up on what you gave me. Well done, the Lord said to him. And the other guy had two, and he doubled up. And he said, here's four. I doubled up. And the Lord said, man, well done. 
But you know what he said? The guy that had nothing to offer, he said, you wicked servant. And he, 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 he put him out. He said, man, you wicked servant. You knew that I was coming back. And so I want to I want to offer God something back. I'm thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful that God reached me where I was. But now I'm, I'm saved. I've been saved now since 1995. There should be I should be able to look in the rear view and there's a fruit that remains. There should be something back there that says I've been walking with Jesus and there's some fruit. Amen. And again, I, I challenge every guy here to consider you just consider your life this this year. God, what have I done with my life? Twelve months have gone by from last Christmas to this Christmas. You know, I'm here now. What have I what have I been doing? What's I, what, what have my life been about? What have I majored in? What have I gotten better at? What have I given my heart to? What have I given my time to, my passion to? And this isn't to beat up anybody. I want you to acknowledge it. Because some guys here are gonna say, I've been, I've been, I've been running with Jesus. And you're gonna look back and see that, man, I've been running with the Lord. I'm, I'm further along in the Lord. Praise God. For you guys that can look back and see that you're making progress. You're having an impact. You're, you're running to win. You're, you're, you're doing what God gave you to do. But there, there, there are no doubt guys in here that can look back and say, Yeah, this hasn't been a great year. You know, I haven't, I, I this you don't want to know the fruit that I left back there. You know, some of y'all need to sow different seeds this year. And as you look back and see them, the stuff that's going to start sprouting from what you've been sowing. And so Paul says, look, everybody competes for a prize, but we're, we're competing for something eternal, something that's going to last forever. It's not a temporal thing. And so we want to be mindful about that. God, help me to major in the things that matter for eternity. Let me give myself to those things. Rob was talking about the Bible reading plan. We do that with our church every year. Me and my wife have been doing that for probably 12 years. Um, and I can tell you how many guys start coming up with excuses about February. Well, you know, it's just, that's just too much to read. You know, I like to read, like, slower. You know, and it's like, no, that's why you ain't never been through your whole Bible. Christians are the only religion that most of us haven't been through our whole, haven't read our whole book. Most other religions, they've read their whole book cover to cover, but us. I mean, in our, our church on midweeks, we're in, the, we're in the minor prophets. And people are like, we're in, what, what's Amos? Where, huh? What that is? What, what book is that? It's all stuck together. They got to unglue it from the, the pages and whatnot. And so um, I encourage you guys to, as the new year starts, I mean, y'all jump on that. Read through the Bible in a year. Be able to conversate with everybody. You get an Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and a Proverb every day. It's a great discipline. And for the guys, they'll say, no, I like to study. Well, then go study afterwards. I do the reading every day, and then I go back and study something that spoke to me, something that stuck out. And so it's a good, it's a good discipline to get into first thing every morning. God, you speak first. You give me the opportunity to speak into my life. So moving on, look at verse 26 now. Paul says, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Let me stop right there. It says, so Paul says, therefore, so because of this, because I'm not running for a perishable crown, he says, so therefore I run thus. I'm not running aimlessly. I'm not running like I don't know where I'm going. I'm not running in circles like some, some kid running at the park. Paul says, look, I'm, I got to focus about what I'm doing. I'm, I know where I'm going. I'm running in this way. I'm running to win this thing. And I believe that as we, again, as we move forward, as, particularly as men, there should be some clarity about the steps that we're taking right if somebody walked up to you and said hey we're what's God called you to do do you have an answer from God for that some guys you ask what, what, what's God called you to do well you know I just kind of feel no nope, it's not what I asked I don't want to care about your feelings <laughs> what's God called you to do what's God spoke that means he that means you spend time with him at some point he spoke to you something and you understand what God wants in you so you, so you could obey it or not What's God called you to do? And everybody here, God's called you to do something. So it's something to pray about if you don't know. If you do know, it's something to obey. Every man in this room, if you're a believer, God has called you first to himself. And God is every, he's given every man something to do. One thing God has not called anybody to do is to get saved and sit at church till they die. God, I mean, that, that, you, you don't see that in your Bible anywhere. Nobody in the Bible got saved and sat at church. They got saved, they sat at Jesus' feet, and then they went to be about the business of doing something for the Lord. And so, amen. So make sure you're doing something. Make sure you're not just sitting, you know, warming up a seat every week, you know. Um, but that the Lord, God, what's, what's my part? What do I do here? What if every man in this church found his place in his, in his home and in this church serving Jesus? What would that look like? That would probably be amazing. What would the wives say? If every man, if every husband knew what he was called to do, some of your wives are held up because their job is to support you and what God called you to do. 
But if you don't know what God called you to do, you're messing up the whole program. And some of your wives, what they have to do is they, they just got to hear from God for themselves so they can go serve God because you won't. But the, the true order, you look at Adam and Eve, God made Adam out of the dust. God gave Adam a job, named the animals, tend the gardens, don't eat from that tree. And then God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a wife helper comparable to him and put him to sleep and made him a wife to come help him. Not to lead him, not to boss him, but to help him. Help him do what? Help him do what God had already called him to do. And then the wife came. And her job was help him do what God already called him to do. That was the order. And so you got a man that knows God, a man that knows what God's called him to do, that's doing it, and God looked and said, that brother needs some help. I'm going to give him a wife. Wife's a helper, a helpmate. Come alongside and help him fulfill the vision I gave him. But what happens in a marriage where you got a man that supposedly knows God, but don't spend no time with him and has no sense of focus of what God's called him to do. And he's, he gets a wife. You got a helpmate that's frustrated. She's like, I'm supposed to, I know I'm to her heart. I'm supposed to follow you and I'm supposed to help you, but you ain't going nowhere. You ain't doing nothing. You're not pursuing the Lord. And she may, she may look at you and know, I know he ain't seeking the Lord. So she may just start seeking the Lord and she'd be off serving some sideways place. And, and God said, that's not the goal. And maybe for some of you guys, this is a year where, you get, in, you get in your right place as men. So your wife said so you can love them and lead them spiritually, not boss them, not, not be mannish and mean, but that you would be lovingly leading them spiritually, that they could come alongside you and follow what the Lord has given for you guys to be doing. Amen? And um, I, I would really encourage that. If there's, if we're running for something, man, we're running, we're fighting, we're winning, we're running, we, that's what we want to do. I want to I run in the direction that God has called me to go in because I'm a, I'm a family man. I got, I got five people behind me. I got a wife and four kids um, that I, I got to be about what God's called me to be, and they're, they're all going to be right there behind, coming alongside. And then God haven't called me to anything that he didn't consider them in the process. We're all called together. And so moving on, he said, look, everybody competes, but not for, sorry, for the perishable crown. He said in verse 26, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Um, but he says, thus I fight not as one that beats the air. And so, but before we move on to the idea of, of fighting, um, Paul, Paul gives some other analogies of running elsewhere in the word. And one of them that I would just um, put to us in um, Hebrews 12, Paul said that we're surrounded by so great, it's, it's chapter 12, verse one and two, by so great a cloud of witnesses that we're to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. He says, look, lay aside the weights and the sins that are ensnaring, that are hindering us in our race. And so if there's anybody here, those are two different things. They're weights. These are things that are not sins, but they're slowing you down. That could be sports. That could be some hobby. That, that could be something that it's just got, it's got too big of a place in your life at this time. Guys, lay aside the weights. And then they're obvious, they're sins. And Again, since I just have men tonight, um, the things that seem to be common and prevalent in this era right now for men, sexual sin, pornography, um, just things that people are doing in the dark, um, that they just go and they go and they get away with it and nobody knows it. Um, these things will hinder you. These, are, these things are jam you up in your relationship with the Lord. When he says, look, lay aside all the weights and the sins that are easily just ensnare you and hold you back. Um, is there some stuff you need to lay down? Is there weights that you would look at and say, man, I got to stop that? Uh, over, over the course of my walk with the Lord, there have been times where there have definitely been weights and stuff that God said, man, you got to stop that. That's, there's too much of that right now. I used to build saltwater reef fish tanks, and I got too into it because um, I'm a passionate person. When I get into something, I usually don't get into something a little bit. And I had, I, I had a whole wall that was a reef tank, and every payday I was buying stuff. I had books that I was reading up on all the sea creatures. And every time I go to the bathroom, I take my Bible at my house. And on this one particular night, I went to the bathroom, and I left my Bible, but I took that big book, all the sea creatures, and I was sitting in there reading it. And my wife is real smooth, you know. She's not a big, mouthy person. She just, what she did was she opened up the bathroom door, and she just slid my Bible on the table <laughs> and slid out. And I'm telling you, it was, that was the, she might as well scream because right there God said, look at, look at, look at what you're doing. I put that thing up on Craigslist. 
I just said, man, I got to part with it. You know, I like it too much. Not a sin, but it was becoming a weight. It was getting in the way. Um, now, as a Christian, I've also had times where there was sin. Um, and I'm going to just briefly hit on this with you guys. I'm positive that in a room like this, there are guys that are dealing with um, areas of sexual sin, secret sin. So for me, when I, when I, before I gave my life to the Lord, when I was a kid, I got, I got introduced to pornography at nine. And that was a part of my life. Uh, I would go to my dad's house every weekend. My dad had a whole area in the room that was magazines, VHS tapes. And I would go every weekend and just take some home and to my mom's and I would take it back and just switch it out. Like I was going to the video store every weekend. I was perverse early. Um, I got, I started having sex in seventh grade. I got kicked out of St. Eugene Catholic school in eighth grade for having sex at school in the back of the church. Um, and that was, that was, there was a perversion in my mind that was, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but it was just, that's how I thought. And that's what I wanted girls for. And I got good at getting girls everywhere I went. And I went to school in high school. I ran through that all through high school. That was my thing. And I got out of high school and I did more and I did more. And so I give my life to Christ in October of 1995. And I was living with a girl. I was cheating on her anyway. Broke up with her. She moved out. Um, and then I realized, man, I got a problem. This thing has a grip on me. And God delivered me from alcohol and cigarettes and greed for money and, and anger and wrath. All that was gone. But the thing I kept falling back into with, I would have be moments. This, and this is before cell phones and pornography was even available in the ways it's available now. Um, but I would, it would be periodic. I may go four or five months and then boom, I'd fall and watch pornography, masturbate. Those are, the, those, those go together, um, you know, like coffee and cream. And so that would be the thing that would happen. And I would just be like, man, why, why am I, why I'm not overcoming this Lord? And I used to think it was God's fault. I'm like, God, you took that and you took that and you took this, but, but you won't take this. And that was wrong. It wasn't that God wouldn't take it. I wouldn't give it up. I wouldn't repent of it. I, I liked it too much, and I wouldn't change. I wouldn't give it over to the Lord. And so um, for me, it, it grew to a point where I was just, I, I go so long, I may go a whole year, and then boom, I fall. And so I just said, man, I, 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 and one thing I had never done, I had never confessed this openly. It was just a very private sin. And so there was a time I went to a men's retreat, about 300, my first men's retreat I ever went to. Odin Fong spoke out of the book of Revelation. He spoke about the church of Ephesus. And he talked about how that they had, you know, he said they, all these commendations about him. You know, you guys, you know, do you guys have patience and you have this and you have that and you put out the false teachers and comm commendation, commendation, commendation. And then God said, nevertheless, I have this against you. And when he said that, it might have been, it might as well have been the Holy Spirit just doing this to me right there and just saying, I, this is what I have against you. And if you don't deal with it, I'm going to deal with you. And I remember I was just busted. And they, afterwards, one of the, the men's leader pastor went up, Pastor Glenn. He said, hey, anybody want to share what the Lord spoke to him? And God spoke to me. He said, get up and confess. Don't hide it anymore. And I stood up in that room to 300-something men. I confessed. I went home and told my wife everything, confessed, um, and started having accountability and all those things. And I, I, I found out something real powerful, that when this thing was taken out of the dark, where Satan had a grip on me and brought into the light where I'm not going to hide this thing. I'm going I'm to deal with it. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to repent of it. When it was brought into the light, that's when I began to have victory, lengthy victory, ongoing victory. And so if you're here and you're a man and you're trying to go forward with the Lord and you got this thing and it just, I guarantee you, it's, 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 if there's something that keeps coming up, one of the ways that we stay ensnared in our sin is that we hide it. And when you walk in, Satan is a prince and power of the air. Satan is the, his kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. And if you leave it in the dark, you will not get victory in the dark. You bring it into the light. There's something supernatural about confession. And confession happens in two ways. First John 1, 9 says you confess to God to be forgiven, right? Confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. But there's another confession in James. And James says confess your trespasses, James 5, 16. A trespass is a willful stepping over the line. Confess your trespasses to one another, and then it says, and pray for one another. And note this, that you may be healed. Well, if I'm trespassing, why well, I need to be healed? I need to be, what I, and think about this. If I had cancer, I can't heal myself. I need God to touch me. 
Guys, if you're trespassing, you're probably in bondage somewhere where you need God to touch you. And so confess your trespass to one another and then pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. That is the context for that verse. And so if you're here and in bondage because you keep it in the dark, um, even in a place like this, man, grab somebody. Grab you one of these brothers and say, hey, I'm gonna come in. I want to come into the light with this thing today. Um, it 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 it'll be the thing that brings you into a place of freedom. And and if and to me, I, I I could just speak for myself. There was so much hindered before that happened in my life. Um, I wasn't you know I, I felt I didn't feel like I should be speaking to people. I didn't feel like witnessing. Though I it would be in my heart to do it, but I felt like I'm a hypocrite. I know I know I'm flawed over here. I know I'm messing up over here, and it, it would hinder me in my life. And it seemed like when that got dealt with, there was just a floodgate of things that opened up where God was saying, I, all these things he wanted to do that I was I was hindering. And so, again, maybe for some of you guys this year, if there's weights or sins that are hanging you up in your walk with the Lord, would you deal with it today, right? Confess it, repent of it. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. It says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You confess it, and then you turn your back on it, and God says, I will have mercy on you. He's telling you that straight up. You confess your sins, and you forsake it, and God will have mercy on you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So don't run from him. Run to him uh, whatever, whatever, with whatever it is that you got going on. And so um, as we come to the close here, he says, um, verse 26 again, for I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one that beats the air. And if you guys know anything about fighting, when, you, when you're in a fight, if you're a boxer, you don't want to be missing. You don't want to hit the air. You know, if a guy keeps missing, they say, oh, he's going to throw his arms out. You know, if a guy's throwing heavy punches and he misses and misses and misses, he's throwing himself out. Now, if you take those same punches and they connect, 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 well, he's, he's exerting energy, but that guy is taking damage at the same time. He's not wasting his effort. Some of us are wasting our effort. Paul said, don't fight like that. Don't, don't, don't run with uncertainty like you don't know what you're doing. And don't fight like somebody that's beating the air. Um, where you're just wasting your energy and your effort. Don't do that. And then he says this in verse 27. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, least when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, look, I, I'm, I'm aware that as I'm, I'm preaching to other people, that I, I still got to deal with me. And that's a word for all of us that are in the ministry, that are serving. Yes, we're trying to help other people, but I'm still got to deal with me. Uh, I still wake up every morning very much a sinner. I still wake up every morning very much a man that I need Jesus for me. I need to be built up in my own walk with the Lord. And so um, I don't, that's, a, that's another reason why I like to do the Bible reading. It's, it's one reading that I do that have nothing to do with anybody else. I'm not doing this to preach it on Sunday or to share it with somebody else in the group. I'm doing that reading just for me. If anybody does it and you did it today, we're reading, you're in the New Testament, you're in Revelation. In the Old Testament, you're in Amos. And then the New Testament, reading through the seven churches. And I'm just kind of combing through those. Lord, evaluate me. It's evaluation time for me. And I'm like, man, perfect time of the year to be going through it. I want to be evaluated. Sift me through these things as I read through them. This is for me. This is just me and Jesus' time. And so have that. Have some time for the Lord to just, just purge you and sift through and meet with you and deal with you on whatever it is. And so Paul said, look, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Leech. When I preach to others, I become disqualified. Paul said, look, I don't want to help them, and then God don't even get me. It's not that we don't want to help people, but we want to take heed to ourselves. And so I would like to close with a verse in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And um, it's another verse from the Apostle Paul as he was, um, Paul had been threatened, you know, and and was, you know, threatened about the, the work he was doing. And, and he, had, he, he had all kind of threats. Paul was beaten, jailed, threatened, you name it. But Acts 20, 24, one of my favorite verses from the Apostle Paul, he says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life as dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel, the grace of God. How do we make sure we finish our race with joy? He said a few things. He said, first of all, don't let anything move you. Don't, anything, don't let anything that someone else is doing take you off course. You make sure you run your race. 
Don't be distracted by the things around you. Don't, don't let other people and other things take you off course. He said, none of these things move me because God called me to do this. He says, I don't count my life as dear to myself. Right? Don't live for yourself. Live for the Lord. We die to ourselves that we might live for the Lord. So I don't count my life as dear to myself. I'm not trying to preserve my life, save my life, keep my life. I've given my life to Jesus, nor do I count my life as dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. And so, brothers, as we come to we come to the end of a year, come to a Christmas season and move into a new year. This in mind, right? As you wrap this year up, um, it's a good time to evaluate what's going on. I'm going to get ready to pray with us. And I do want to give a chance for men to deal with things that they need to get dealt with tonight. Let's be let's leave, let's be right. But we about to go grub in a few minutes. But can we sit down and eat right with Jesus? Can we be right with the Lord, guys? D deal with it tonight. If there's stuff that needs to, didn't be, need to be dealt with, deal with it tonight. And so we want to be right. I, I got Christmas coming. I'm thankful for the gift of Jesus. And I want to offer him my very best. Uh, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I don't earn salvation. It's a gift from God. But I, I want to offer God, I want to say, I want my life to at least say to the Lord, thank you. I'm thankful for what you did for me. And again, as I move into a new year, some people not some, some people didn't make it to the end of this year. Some people aren't here. Some people not moving into 2019. M more than likely we are. I hope all y'all will be there, you know. Uh, more than likely we are. And so, God, as we do, may we do so with vision and with purpose. May we not wander into 2019, but may we walk into it full of purpose, I've heard from the Lord. I've been with the Lord. This is what I'm going to be working on this year. This is what God wants me to be focused on. I'm moving into a new year with God, with purpose and vision that came from the Lord. Amen. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity to gather. And I pray now as we just take a minute to respond to you, Lord, to reflect. God, I pray that you would move among us tonight as only you can. God, I pray you would pour out your spirit in this room, on, on these men, on all of us. And God, I pray if there are guys that have weights and sins, things that have hindered them from really running with you with everything that they have. God, I pray that you would reveal those things to them. I pray for the conviction of your spirit. And I pray you would help us to be obedient, God, that we would yield to you. That we would uncover sin, hide sin, defend our sin, protect our sin. God, I pray we would expose it, confess it, and forsake it in this room tonight, that you might have all of us, that you, you might take us unbound and unhindered into 2019. God, I pray you would deal with these men, that you would help us tonight. And so I'm going to ask this, and everybody just take a moment. We're going to have a moment with Jesus. This is about you, so you can close your eyes and just sit there and just deal with the Lord between you and him. First of all, if you're here, and if there is an uncertainty in your mind, as to whether you would go to heaven if you died tonight. If you don't know that your sins are forgiven, if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, if there's not a confidence uh, by, from the Spirit of God that lives in you that, that you're his, but you want to be forgiven, you want to be saved, you want to know that tonight, um, I want to pray for that first. If there's anybody here that would say, you know what, I need to give my life to the Lord or I need to give my life back to the Lord tonight. Would you raise up your hands and just, uh, God bless you. God bless you. Have no shame, guys. This is a, we came here for this. God bless you in the back. There's there's not, there's no shame in saying yes. God bless you back there. If that's your need, God bless you, brother. No shame, man. There's no shame. Ain't nobody here gonna judge you. God is the only one that can judge us. And the Bible says when one of us repents that all of heaven rejoices, this pleases the Lord. When we acknowledge our sinfulness, acknowledge that we need him and we cry out to him. Anybody else that you're listening don't let your pride keep you stuck where you are. Don't worry about your position among the body here, the men. Worry right now about your relationship with the living God. What's your position before him? And if you need to straighten that up, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Anybody else that God is speaking to you and you know that you need to, God bless you guys. I see you both. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm going to pray for us right now. I'm going to pray for that group. Everyone that just acknowledged that. God of, God of heaven, we pray. I thank you for each man that raised their hand, Lord. Just you know the hearts of each man. God, you know why they you, you know what's going on in their hearts. And as they raise their hands, acknowledging that they want to be forgiven, they want to come to you tonight, they want to come back to you. God, we thank you for what you teach us in the Word of God. Thank you that the blood of Jesus was poured out for these guys. Thank you that your blood cleanses us, 
us, Lord, and washes away our sin. Thank you that as we come to you, you don't turn us away. You receive us. You don't reject us. And so, Lord, as they reach out for you tonight, God, I pray you would forgive them, you would cleanse them, and you would begin a fresh work of your spirit in their hearts and lives. Thank you, Lord, for drawing them to yourself. And I'm going to invite you guys to pray this out loud to the Lord. Uh, just a prayer confessing Jesus to be the Lord of your life. If you're here, you already believe, you can pray this with them. But pray this out loud. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you that he rose from the grave and conquered sin, death, and Satan for me. Jesus, I confess you to be the Lord of my life. I ask that you would fill me with your spirit and help me to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. And I want to just encourage the guys that pray that, that you speak with one of the pastors or leaders and let them know that they might give you some things to help you continue walking with the Lord. But I also want to pray for guys that have sin that they need to just deal with. I know there are guys here that you got stuff and you just need to deal with it. And, and, and just like that, don't hide it. Don't conceal it. Um, you only hide stuff that you're trying to keep. But we're trying to expose it and deal with it tonight. And I, I want to just encourage you guys to let tonight be a night where you would just deal with the things that have held you back, that you would move into this next year and there wouldn't be anything holding you back uh, because you confessed it and because you repented of it. And now it's just you and Jesus and there's nothing in between you. And so uh, I'm going to ask right now, there are guys that would say, you know what, I, I do have stuff. I need to be forgiven. I need to be cleansed. And I need strength. Stand up to your feet. Stand up to your feet. And I ask you to stand up to your feet because it's it's a way of just it's it's a step forward saying I'm not I'm not I'm not hiding anything. I just wanna I just wanna be right with God. And I'm gonna tell you guys there's, there's a power in a heart that says, I wanna be right with God more than I wanna look holy to other people. I wanna be right with God. That's how we wanna get, that's where we wanna be. God, I just wanna be right with you. Never mind how I look to people. I want I care about how I look to you. And so um, one thing God promises us for in the areas where we are weak, he is strong. And he'll give us his strength for our weakness. But we got to be real. And so I'm going to pray for you guys. And I'm going to encourage you guys beyond this right now that you guys will come. Whatever it is, I'm not going to ask you to come up here and say it. But you confess to someone that you know loves Jesus and will hold you accountable. Tell somebody. Tell the Lord because he'll forgive you. But confess it to somebody. Get it out of the dark. Someone that will hold you accountable. Someone that'll check on you. Someone that you could just say, hey, man, pray for me. You know, I blew it. And I, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to get stuck. I don't want to get into a rut. So I'm, I'm telling on myself, have that with somebody. And so, Father in heaven, we ask right now for these men. Thank you for each one of them. Thank you, Lord, that there's a desire to no longer walk in darkness, but to walk in the light, Lord. God, I pray for these men that you would help them, Lord. Thank you that where we're weak, you are strong. Thank you, God, that you didn't, you didn't raise from the dead just to conquer sin, Lord. You conquered just to conquer the penalty of sin. You, you conquered the present power that sin has over us. God, we can truly be free through you. God, I pray for these men tonight. That you would, I pray that, that some of these guys would never go back to these vices, Lord, that they would be set free in the name of Jesus. God, I pray you would fill them with your spirit. That, God, you would help them to not just walk out into the light tonight, but that that would become the normal pattern. They would continue to walk in the light, Lord. And whatever's been hindered as they walked in darkness, I pray they would be excited for the new season of walking with you, Lord, what you have for them, what you want to do in them and with them and through them for your glory. And, God, I thank you for the blood of Jesus, that they can be cleansed and forgiven. And I thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they can be empowered to walk in victory ongoing. And so, God, would you cleanse and forgive, and would you empower and strengthen these men that they might walk with you in power from this day on. Jesus, we thank you for loving sinners. Thank you for making a way for us. Thank you for your provision. We worship you. We honor you. Help us. God, it's our heart's desire to give you our best. Help us to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>